Camera? Check. Hello? There, oh, we go. there we go. Hi, everyone. We're starting just on time, a rarity for Esalen and PCC, so this is a good start. Um, it's my You don't need it. I can talk loud enough. <laughs> um, Matt doesn't really need much of an introduction. He certainly has um, a, a great reputation amongst our crowd of really beautifully integrating poetry and spiritual beauty with academic rigor that we've all kind of come to know him so well for. Um, Matt was one of my first friends at PCC. One of our first times hanging out, we um, went to a, a study group on Hegel. We were taking Sean's class and. After two hours of intensely reading together and, and discussing, we left and we were in the streets and I was like, this might be really weird. And I was like, do you wanna study Hegel more together? And I'm like, yeah, so we had a, a six hour Hegel-thon. It was really amazing and, and we've been friends ever since and um, certainly honored that he's carrying on the, the legacy of the forum, he and Becca, that um, you guys are our successors, so. Um, yeah, so I, it won't take up much more time. We've all seen him on YouTube. And, um, <laughs> he's just a, a brilliant scholar, um, an amazing friend, and one of the best people. So, Matt. Cool. Thank you, Jamie. Um, it's really exciting for me to be able to present in front of um, you know so many good friends and and. Um, colleagues uh, and um, I'm more excited this year than I've ever been in the past because I feel like that wasn't me <laughs> I feel like um, we have such a, a cauldron of, of creativity uh, and being able to share my ideas with you um, is exciting because I can't wait for your feedback so I'm gonna rush through this and we can have discussion um, at the end so cosmopolitical theology um, violence, Value, and the Push for a Planetary People. That's the title of this talk. Uh, and it really, most of the ideas that I'm going to try to weave together here uh, emerged for me at the end of last year when the Occupy movement um, started to get underway. And, and um, it, is that my. Um, I don't know what's going on, but. The Occupy movement started to get underway, and it brought politics to life for me in a new way. Over here? Uh, my notes are on here. Uh, I'm not moving anymore. Um, so the Occupy movement brought politics to life for me in a new way. Prior to that, politics was something as an American that I did every four years on election day. And besides that, I'm sort of watching and observing what these other politicians are doing. But I didn't feel like I was participating. And then the Occupy movement happened. And all of a sudden, I got excited about politics again. So part of this presentation is, is the question about the question, what is, what is politics really? Because usually, uh, even for politicians, it's kind of a bad word. Like they'll, as a diss, they'll say, oh, my opponent, he's just playing politics, right? But you're politicians, you're supposed to be doing politics, that's what, that's what it's about. So I'm, it's an attempt, I'm gonna, going to attempt to redeem this word politics um, by putting it into a larger context, namely a cosmopolitical and a theological context. Um, uh, and also an artistic context with, and a poetic context, which I think will become clear. Um, so this word cosmopolitics uh, comes from uh, a philosopher of science, Isabel Stengers. She's, um, she was trained as a chemist and worked with Ilya Prigogine uh, in, in the late 60s and 70s, um, and then got into philosophy as she, she started to question um, the methods of science and the way that politics and the marketplace were interfering with how science was done. Um, and she brought Whitehead's um, cosmological, uh, imaginative way of engaging with, with the cosmos uh, and, his, and Whitehead's metaphysics to bear on these questions of what is science, how is scientific knowledge constructed. Um, so she defines this word cosmopolitics um, by focusing on 
the prefix cosmos. What does that mean for her? So she says, um, the, the prefix cosmos should not be confused with what we call the universal. The universal is a question within the tradition that has invented it as a requirement and also as a way of disqualifying those um, who do not refer to it. So in other words, universal human rights. Beautiful thing, but who's human? Who counts as a member of the human family? Is it just our species? Do we treat other species as, as persons in some sense? So she's, she's not trying to give a universalist um, um, picture here of, of politics by bringing in the cosmos. Um, because in the, in the past, that's tended to disqualify certain others from part, being part of our community. She says the cosmos has nothing to do with this universal or with the universe as an object of science, an object of science. The prefix makes present and helps resonate the unknown that affects our questions um, that our political tr tradition has in the past disqualified. It's disqualified certain questions about the unknown, about the cosmos, the larger body and, and, and soul body that encompasses us. Um, so she says, the cosmos corresponds to no condition and establishes no requirement. It creates the question of possible non-hierarchical modes of coexistence among the ensemble of inventions of non-equivalence. That's her fancy way of talking about other organisms. Inventions of non-equivalence, differences between species of organisms that must coexist. Um, cosmos is a way of talking about the diverging values and obligations through which the entangled existences that compose the cosmos are informed. Um, so this word cosmos in cosmopolitics integrates problematically the question of an ecology of practices that would bring together our cities where politics was invented uh, with the larger community of life outside of the cities. Um, so cosmopolitics is not beyond politics but designates access to a question that politics cannot appropriate. So she's not trying to reduce politics to cosmology um, she's certainly not trying to reduce politics to our scientific knowledge uh, of the cosmos um, because for Stengers, um, science is always um, built up uh, out of uh, a series of, of cultural practices. She wants to bring science and politics together in a way that doesn't reduce science to politics but that also doesn't... Um, place science on a pedestal where it's all about objectivity uh, and facts that are constructed outside of the shared concern that we have as a community. Um, and to, to make this, um, this distinction, uh, Stengers talks about the move from a knowledge economy to a knowledge ecology. Um, and this is, the, the knowledge economy is, is what um, you know, many of us know as, as the academic world of, of publishing and the scientific world that's funded by the state and by industry um, for the purposes of, of profit, ultimately. So science has been co-opted by this search for economic growth and profit, right? Um, and if you look at economy, um, the, the suffix there uh, is nomos, which it refers to human norms, human laws. Um, Whereas a knowledge ecology, um, the suffix there is, is logos, right? Which instead of referring to an anthropocentric human norm, uh, ultimately refers to a cosmic norm uh, or to a divine uh, source of ordering that's not constructed by the human in our societies, but is informing the human society and the larger community of life um, in, in a a numinous way um, that permeates us um, from a, a, a depth beyond just our um, local cultural um, norms. Um, <clears throat> so a knowledge ecology is about generating knowledge that's not so much concerned with objectivity or modestly witnessing nature as if 
our knowledge of it was not already constructed by the attitude that we're taking towards the natural world. Knowledge ecology is more of a knowing with. Um, it's, it, the astronomer is knowing with the stars. Uh, the biologist is knowing with cells. The biochemist is knowing with molecules. And there's alliances built between human scientists and um, the, the, the larger community of, of beings uh, in the cosmos. So that the reliability of our knowledge then always depends upon the cohesiveness of this larger social fabric, not just the human social fabric, but the community of life. Um, knowledge is relationship. Uh, and in that sense, knowledge is always going to be um, risky because we're building relationships with beings who we don't fully understand. And so we have to, we have to work very carefully to build these alliances because they're, they're always fragile. Um, we don't know when they're going to break. And we learn a lot when these alliances break. That's when we discover that our theory was not actually um, in congruence with what we were studying. So Stengers, as I said, very influenced by Alfred North Whitehead. Uh, and her, her understanding of this concept of cosmopolitics has a lot to do with how she sees what she sees uh, as the, the role of the university in our society. And as Whitehead said, the task of a university is the creation of a future of the future. Um, so the growth of the knowledge ecology is intimately tied to uh, the thriving of uh, our civilization. It's, it's intimately tied to the adventure of our civilization. And our, our role as um, knowledge producers is to further this process of civilization. Um, and what this highlights is the fact that uh, as as citizens, we have to be educated um, in order to become responsible for one another's freedom. That freedom isn't something that we're born with by nature. It's something that we learn in community to protect in one another and to foster in one another. Um, so freedom is, is, is an achievement by a community. The, in, the freedom of an individual is the achievement of a community uh, and the university I think is supposed to be that communal context that allows us each to discover our freedom. Um, another aspect of cosmopolitics is connecting the cosmos and the city. So this leads Whitehead to say that we seek the evidence for that conception of the universe, which is the justification for the ideals characterizing the civilized phases of human society. Um, so Whitehead is drawn to cosmology in order to justify the aims of our civilization. And if civilization's values are not congruent with the larger dynamics at play in the universe, then the civilization's not viable, right? Um, so Whitehead doesn't think of our scientific study of the, of the cosmos as something that takes place outside of society and politics, but rather th there has to be a link um, a recognition of um, the way in which science is, in many ways, a construction of society, which doesn't make it less real and less about facts, but it's a construction of, of society um, that, can, that can be um, badly constructed, or it can be truly constructed. And in this case, true would mean incongruence with the cosmos. Um, Whitehead, of course, is, is drawing on the, um, the Platonic tradition, and I think the cosmopolitical concept that Stengers and Whitehead are developing is um, really rooted in a Platonic view of the universe and, and, and um, Plato's understanding of what the city can be, ideally. Um, but of course, Plato's, Plato's Republic um, does not describe uh, a democratic form of government. It describes an aristocratic form of government. And the question is, what, is, what does that mean exactly? <coughs> what is aristocracy? Uh, and it comes from the root um, arete. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it. Which means excellence um, or virtue. So it's the rule of the virtuous, the rule of the excellent. Um, and Plato wasn't completely against democracy, his, his, his argument was just that we must all be virtuous as individuals for democracy to work. 
Um, otherwise, I think what, what we see in, um, in our country is that there's this, what's called the masses. And the masses are mediated by certain forms of um, uh, mass media that um, manufacture our opinions for us. And unless we are part of communities like universities that foster our ability to think freely as individuals, we cannot really form a democracy. We're just going to be ruled from the top based on the way that the media uh, uses all of these technologies that are inundating our daily lives to manufacture our opinions for us. So we have to take Plato's arist aristocratic form of ideal um, governance into context in that way. Um, you know, when Plato wrote in the, the dialogue uh, Protagoras, uh, Protagoras, I think it is, that, uh, that um, uh, Pericles, the great uh, Athenian um, leader, uh, when, when he was um, uh, leading the Athenian democracy at that time, uh, Plato said that, you know, democracy will work if you have a leader like uh, Pericles, who's virtuous and who instills virtuous values in the people. Um, but if you don't have a leader like that, then democracy can lead to tyranny because people's opinions are easily manipulated uh, by media. Um, so the other component uh, of this talk is, is the theological component. Uh, and this is coming largely from this book uh, by Simon Critchley, who is uh, a philosopher who teaches at the New School, I think, in New York. Um, this book Faith of the Faithless Experiments in Political Theology. Uh, I just read this summer. Um, and Critchley uh, engages with um, Jacques Rousseau, um, and he engages with uh, medieval Christian mystics, mostly females. Um, and he himself is an atheist. It's Faith of the Faithless. But he's recognizing the role that religion has to play and has always played in the formation of a people, of, of a society, of a community, that in order, religion allows us to get beyond our individual sense of egoism to connect to a larger um, ideal, um, to connect to the, the um, values of a community as a whole rather than just our own private ends. So he has all these, these wonderful phrases that he, uh, that he coins in this book. Uh, he talks about soul smithing. Um, which is akin to soul making, I think, which is something I've talked about in the past here at Esalen. Um, and he connects soul smithing to a politics of love, such that we recognize the way in which the soul is made in public. It's something that we help each other to create through uh, acts of love. Um, so the soul is not something we're given fully formed at birth. It's something we grow and develop as part of a community. Um, so to become a free person, one needs to belong to a loving community. Um, he has this phrase, the uh, mystical anarchism, um, which is Critchley's way of trying to appropriate certain forms of, of heretical um, Christianity uh, in order to talk about an omnicentric divinity that, that lives um, in each of us and that can be evoked when given the right conditions, given the conditions of a loving community. Um, so this is, this is a picture of the divine, um, not as um, um, lording over and dominating the universe, but a, a, a divinity that infinitely inhabits the universe, that inhabits um, all creatures in a unique way through the many forms of, of creaturely life. Um, and so for Critchley, much like for Plato, democracy would only work if uh, everyone becomes godlike, if everyone becomes like God and realizes their, their inner divine likeness. Um, he also talks about fictional force. And for him, politics is a poetic task, which means that, uh, like religion, um, politics is about myth. It's about narrative. It's about um, vision and imagination. Um, and about bringing forth livable worlds together through story. 
Um, we, we create our meaning by, um, I, I think of it as gossip, gossiping sometimes. Like communities thrive by gossiping about um, how all of their stories intersect. Um, so, polit I mean, think about political discourse these days. It's all about he said, she said, you know, there's a narrative constructed that's really irrelevant to the issues, but ultimately, to engage in politics, you have to be a master at that art of gossiping, of giving the narrative that will dominate um, the story. Okay, so one thing that Critchley does uh, is he moves beyond this narrative that has been dominant for much of the last century or two uh, of, of secularization. So he says, rather than seeing modernity in terms of a process of secularization, I claim that the history of political forms can best be viewed as a series of metamorphoses of sacralization. Um, so that the modern state is, uh, and, and modern capitalism, is a form of theology. It's this theology of money where the highest value is um, the individual and the individual's profits. And the, the god of modern capitalist theology, the theology of money, is this invisible hand that's supposed to reach in from beyond in order to make sure that our individual selfishness somehow results in, in the common good. Right? So that's a story that we tell ourselves, and it's dominant right now. Um, Critchley also says that ours is an economy of the sacral, a violence economy in which political action seems to flow directly from metaphysical conflict. So the reason religion is relevant again today is because of terrorism, for one. Um, there are uh, polities, peoples rising in the world that are willing to sacrifice themselves as individuals, which we as Westerners can't really understand, but they're willing to sacrifice themselves as individuals to commit suicide as a, a political, to create a political uh, statement, right? You know, according to our Western philosophers like Kant, this sort of thing shouldn't even be possible. Uh, we shouldn't suicide uh, in order to um, convey a, a political point isn't, it's irrational, right? So no one should do that if they're rational. And yet that's the kind of world that um, Western military powers have created in concert with this old world religious mentality. Um, you know, together we've concocted this economy of, of violence. Um, so religion is relevant again. Uh, and Certainly, one thing that Occupy did really well is, is to connect the dots uh, between um, institutionalized violence, whether it's here at home with police violence or abroad with um, remote controlled drones bombing people that they think might be involved in something, but who's just, uh, you know, I don't know. There's no court that's deciding that. We're just bombing them. So it's kind of an act of terrorism on our part, I would say. But Occupy connected the dots between, between this institutionalized violence, this normalized violence um, between world trade and global capitalism, terrorism, and ecological devastation. So I think Occupy was really effective at connecting those dots. On the other hand, while it was effective at exposing this violence um, inherent to the capitalist fiction and the theology of money, it didn't yet have a story to replace them. Um, so one of the things that I'm proposing is that with Stenger's and Whitehead's cosmopolitical perspective and Critchley's political theology, we can start to develop a story and a, a worldview and a vision that can replace the theology of money. Because we can critique that all day and Occupy is really good at doing that, but what do you bring forth to replace it? Where, how do you move forward, right? Stenger's writes that the mission, and I think she means religious mission of modernity, has been to civilize others. So who are these others? Uh, I think her point in saying this is not to say that we should give up this modern value of civilization, but that we should distinguish between civilization on the one hand and, and capitalism on the other, uh, and that we need to civilize ourselves. There's an otherness within us that we need to civilize. Um, and the question is, you know, can civilization become an adventure in compassionate and co-creative composition? 
co-creation uh, rather than a competitive conquest ruled by selfishness and the threat of violence. And it all depends on what we value. Do we value loving relationships or do we value money? Um, from my perspective and, and the thinkers I'm drawing from, money doesn't create value. Money destroys value. Money systematically destroys societies, communities, and destroys uh, ecosystems. Um, and it's not that just exchanging um, symbolic units is the evil. It's, it's the value that we attribute to the symbolic units. So we need money. Money is convenient uh, and practical um, as a tool, but we've let the tool become our master. What do I have? Five more minutes, OK. So one of the things that, that this theology of money implies is that all of the value in the universe and in the earth is attributed to it by humans when we take something from nature, the state of nature, we produce it into something to be sold in the marketplace. That's where value comes from um, for the, the capitalist story. What Whitehead says is that uh, actually everything has some value for itself, <laughs> for others, and for the whole. Value characterizes the meaning of actuality itself. So by reason of this character, constituting reality, the conception of morals arises. We have no right to deface the value experience, which is the very essence of the universe. So value isn't something projected by the human onto the universe. The universe itself is valuable. The universe itself enjoys its own existence uh, and strives for greater forms of beauty. And the human economy hasn't respected those, those cosmic values. Um, so one of the things that Stengers talks about is, is what she calls the intrusion uh, of Gaia. Uh, and she does think of Gaia as a goddess. Um, but she doesn't think that we, we should expect Gaia to um, hear our, our, our desire to reconcile ourselves with her. Gaia doesn't speak that sentimental language. Gaia is perfectly comfortable wiping out our entire species uh, if, if we aren't willing to listen to her and to learn from her um, how we should um, live on this earth uh, with, with the larger community of life. Um, so she talks about composing with Gaia and being domesticated by Gaia. So rather than the human going around domesticating things, let's learn from, from the earth uh, how to, to live. Let's, let's look for lessons in um, the ecosystems that have been thriving for millions and millions of years around us for lessons on how to live. Instead of trying to technologically alter the biosphere, uh, let's learn uh, how to live with it and how to build alliances with uh, other species in order to, to flourish ourselves and to also mutually enhance their ability to flourish. But this, this requires giving up um, an aspect of the theology of money, which is the theology of me, the, the individualism that's so essential to our culture. Um, Critchley has developed an, an ethics um, out of the work of Emmanuel Levinas. He calls it the ethics of infinite demand. Uh, and it's an ethical individualism where the self shapes itself in relation to the experience of an overwhelming infinite demand that divides it from itself. And he, he likens this to the, the demand that Christ made in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do, them, do good them that hate you. And this is an infinite demand because we, we, we can't live up to it, really. It's, it's, it's something that we're always striving for, but we never achieve. Um, and it's, it's demanding in the extreme, but he thinks that Giving ourselves over to this demand is what allows us to form communities. Um, and he, he talks about um, this 13th century Christian mystic, uh, Marguerite Parete, um, who was influenced by Eckhart and also influenced Eckhart. I think there was, it was a two-way street. Um, and she talked about the process of the soul transforming itself and being transformed by love. 
Uh, and for her, this was a violent process because the ego doesn't want to give up uh, its, its autonomy, right? So she says one must crush oneself, hacking and hewing away at oneself to widen the place in which love will want to be. The soul does not believe that God has any greater gift to bestow than this love, which love for love has poured forth within her. So, in the secular context in which we still exist, uh, we're unwilling to transform our egos, and so we have this compromise um, between the private and the public sphere. Um, and without the curative of love that Porate is talking about, we get stuck with this, this schizophrenic split um, between mm, the individual on the one hand, I think of the private sphere as sort of, um, it's the tea party, right, that extreme, and then public sphere, it's Occupy saying that, you know, we've, we've got to uh, exist in this completely non-hierarchical um, um, participatory form of democracy uh, where we have general assemblies and through this process of consensus that just goes on and on and on forever where there aren't any authorities, you know, we've got to work out our issues. And I think both of these are extremes that need to be reconciled in a different way. Um, and, you know, in this, in this dualistic picture here, um, a very strange conception of freedom has emerged where in America, freedom is considered to be something private. It's the freedom to... It's the freedom from government influence, the freedom to do what you want, to own your land and do your own thing. This is the exact opposite of what the Greeks thought of as freedom. For the Greeks, freedom uh, was the freedom to participate in the public sphere, to be in debate and dialogue with your peers. And certainly for them, it was white men. We can do better than that, right? But it's, it's being involved in political discourse, whereas... Um, for the Greeks, they thought of privacy as something that, in, that's, what's, that's the kind of lives that slaves led. They weren't involved in the public sphere. So it's, there's a complete reversal. The American conception of freedom is equivalent to, to, to slavery. Um, whereas the Greek conception of freedom is participatory. Like, let's be involved in the construction of our society. Um, so I'm running out of time here. Um, but... I'm just about finished. I'm going to skip that slide. So, actually, run out of time if you want to do a half an hour. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'll just briefly say that one way to get out of this dualism between the public and the private is to adopt a triadic structure like Rudolf Steiner's um, threefold social order, where the structure of the soul which he thinks is tripartite, thinking, feeling, and willing, is mirrored by the structure of society so that the cultural sphere, the economic sphere, and the political sphere operate with relative autonomy. Um, not complete autonomy, obviously, but you know, like all of the profits in the economic sphere would be immediately um, freely donated to the cultural sphere because that's what, we, that's what a society ordered in this way would value, is, is spiritual and cultural development rather than individual profit. Um, so, bottom line, politics, like religion, like art, is fiction. Um, and if we remember that our political institutions were invented, uh, we won't remain slaves to the cycles of violence that they initiate and maintain. Um, and to remember the poetics of politics is to become a citizen again, empowered by the virtues of, of words and songs, to re-legislate the world with others. Uh, which is an idea I'm getting from Shelley, who said that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. So when we engage with one another um, creatively in communities of love, we discover our own freedom, and we, we bring forth worlds where what, what's valued is uh, you know, the creative energy of the universe itself. And we're here to discover what that creative energy can become and to be on an adventure together uh, instead of um, accumulating for ourselves. We work together to, to carry this adventure forward, to evolve together, to see what's next because nobody knows, right? It's always a surprise that that adventure is what I think can guide our civilization um, instead of 
this, this misadventure into private accumulation. Um, so yeah, that'll, that'll about sum it up, I think. So we can